Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the introduction to this new course. Uh, I've counted most of you. Should probably there should be still five or six people who are lost uh, trying to find the classroom, but I hope we'll record them. And uh, okay, we start with this new course called. Uh, Ambient Intelligence, Technology, and Design. Okay, so the goal for my, my goal for today is to start uh, with uh, describing how the course is organized and how we will uh, proceed in the different uh, lectures, and uh, to start, uh, let's say, uh, analyzing the topic of the course, which is ambient intelligence. What do we mean by ambient intelligence? Okay. So, just some basic information you all already know, actually. Uh, we are, this is an elective course, uh, an optional course in the third year, second semester we are here, and uh, which is offered to a, set, a wide set of uh, degrees of uh, laureate types, okay? And uh, the choice of the or the faculty actually was to give, a, or, um, let's say, a set or subset of courses in English. So we will do our best to, say, speak and work in English. It's what I'm speaking is almost English, more or less. If you neglect the accent, uh, the rest should be more or less uh, standard English. Uh, we won't be too, we would try also to speak very simple, in very simple terms, because I know uh, we got into the information that for some people, uh, they, they found the topic maybe interesting, but they saw, okay, it's in English, so maybe it's too difficult for me. I think the level of English we are able to speak, uh, we we'll speak together, is quite, uh, uh, hopes to be quite understandable, okay? Um, so the summary of my presentation. Oh, uh, first of all, then I will give you all the details, but uh, you don't need to copy anything. Okay? These slides are already online. So if you want to copy for your own pleasure, please do. But otherwise, it's better to I say keep the brain for uh, understanding and interacting. Uh, by the way, since I'm talking about interaction, I have here a very nice microphone. So if everybody, with or without the microphone, want to interrupt, ask a question, say their own idea or whatever, just uh, we, we can. OK, this is one of the few courses in which the number of students is not very high. So let's try to exploit this to, uh, to an, advantage, as an advantage for us. OK, if you want in any, in any, at any time, I can see all of you at the same time. So just wave your hand, and uh, we may interact and discuss. Um, the first point is the goal, the course, and the main chapters, the main contents that we will, uh, say, describe. So the goal of the course is, uh, and in general of ambient intelligence, is to be able to learn uh, how to design and possibly, possibly also to realize environments and we will take a very wide definition of environments. There may be a room, a house, a building, a city, or whatever. We'll see that there's much commonality in these different types of what we call environment that enrich the user experience and help inhabitants, users, householders in their activity. So something that you put in the building to help the users. Uh, in uh, better living and better using the building itself. So it's something that should help us. This is the real, the ultimate goal. We will see that it's not so easy to reach, it's not so easy to, uh, to find solutions that actually reach this kind of goal. Um, in thinking about this goal, this ultimate goal, having an environment that helps me in in watching the TV, in cooking, 
in uh, taking my pills if I have a disease, in, uh, uh, in finding my way through a big building or helps me. Whenever I need some help, the building is there, the environment is there to help me. Hmm? Uh, we will try to reason also about how to design this kind of systems. And we'll try to do that in a way which is, uh, I would say, quite different from what you see in general when you see some prototype of a smart, a smart building or something like that. In many cases, we will see that smart environments are built by starting from the technology. So I have these sensors, I have this technology, I have this plant, I have this, and they build something with it. Because the goal maybe is to sell components or to sell the technology. Uh, but the goal of this smart environment is to facilitate the user. So actually, we, we should start thinking the other way around. We start from asking, what does the user want? What features the user want? And then from that, uh, we define the technology that we need. And in this course, in particular in the labs, we'll try to follow this path. We start from a question, from a problem to solve. Okay, we want this environment to have this capability, these features. And then we select the technology. And we must have the possibility of choosing the technology, which, are, which is not so, so easy to do in general. But those, this is one of the goals, of the path that we are going to do together here. Uh, we will also try to learn to reuse as much as possible about what is already available. Uh, there is a, the trend, a, a temptation, okay, to say, okay, I want to, I need to have one kind of a sensor or something that controls the light or some. So the the danger is uh, jumping too quickly from I need a sensor of this kind to I start to design the sensor. So before starting or even thinking about designing something new, we should first look at what is already available and try to integrate it in our system. Okay? And if we don't find anything that fits our needs, of course we can design or we should design something new. But what you see around is a lot of very similar devices that do more or less the same thing, the same things, uh, and they are just built by different people. Hmm? And this is something that you know, uh, consumes resources doing the same thing over and over again. And uh, the, the end, at the end of the course, you should be able, we should be able to have a simple ambient intelligence system, a system that is working within the building of Polytechnico or within some, <laughs> some part, a small part in the lab that we'll use, but something working, really working, that be, is, which is built with, uh, say, real components. So a small scale experiment of an ambient intelligence behavior. That's the, what we will see at the end of the course, is if everything goes right. Um, then, the, say, the next uh, lecture will be more about uh, analyzing the definition, but just to start about what, what we mean with this term, uh, I will be using uh, especially these two keywords, these two definitions of ambient intelligence and uh, intelligent environments. Uh, there is no, let's say, a very strict definition, or there's not even a definition which everybody agrees to. Different types of researchers, as they have different ideas, different points of view, and so they give different uh, definitions for this stuff. Okay, well, I just throw here the, the, the two most, uh, let's say, two recent uh, definitions that more or less try to cover uh, the entire area. Uh, the first just uh, elaborates on the idea that uh, the, an intelligent ambient 
needs to help people or support people in their daily lives, in their activities. Okay, so that's it's what we already say. And it says a bit more about how it does. It, it can support people because it's a digital environment. So it's something built with computer technology. Okay, we know that. And uh, it throws in two adjectives, which is proactively and sensibly. So a system, a computer-based system, interacting with our environment to help the users proactively and sensibly. Proactively means uh, without asking. The environment is able to do the first step. So if I switch something on or off on this uh, um, table, which is a computerized table, I can switch from the uh, whiteboard to the PC and something like that. So this is an, an environment which is in some way smart because there's a computer behind it and it reacts, it reacts to my comments. So it's a reactive system. If I have a, a very smart uh, remote control that is able to control my lights, my blinds, my doors and in my home, it's a smart system that reacts to my comment. So most of the smart systems tend to have an, a reactive behavior. The user gives a command and the system reacts. Proactive means the other way around. The system is able to do the first action without the user being continually, continuously asking for it. So the, the system knows what to do. Knows that whenever I enter a room, maybe the light should be turned on. Very stupid example. Uh, you don't need a very, you just need a sensor for that, but just try to, to extrapolate. And, uh, uh, sen but sensibly. Because when I'm watching TV, maybe I don't want the light being on, even if I am in the room. Because in that specific context, I don't need that behavior. So it's a constant uh, tension between the system being able to do something in favor of the, user, of the user and the system being able to understand when it is the case to do that and when it's better to refrain from acting. So the system should be able, some papers say, to read the mind of the user. Say, okay, what the user wants, which is not so easy uh, nowadays, of course. Okay, the second definition is a bit more complex. Uh, we'll try to break it in pieces because they wanted to use very big words in that. But uh, the, the end point is always the same. I want to enhance the experience of the occupants of the environment uh, with a lot of technologies, which is uh, something which is not networked uh, and some, some hardware, let's say. Some, I, I won't read it word by word. I just see a car, the first two lines here say, I, you need some distributed hardware. Some hardware there with sensor controllers, actuators, and so on. And you need a lot of software, the other two lines. Self-programming, preemptive processes, software agents, and so on. A lot of software which is intelligent enough to take all this information and turn it into something useful for the occupants. So this is what we want to do. It's not just automation, automating stuff. That would be easy, reacting to comments. We want to do some, or try to do something more. Okay. Today, if you go to a, to a shop and ask, oh, I want my home to be intelligent, there is no solution for that. They will sell you something, of course, but it won't be intelligent in the sense of these definitions. Today, there's no solution for that. So we are, in some sense, on the, on the forefront of the, of the research hmm, in, the time, in terms of topics that we are dealing with. So if we want to have a picture for visualize all of that, we see that we have an environment which is enriched with a lot of devices of different types, sensors, actuators, uh, interfaces and so on. We will, uh, of course, have 60 hours to, to, to dwell into those. And all these devices in some way should be managed in a uniform way. Today, probably in your home, you already have a lot of smart devices. You have the smart TV, you have uh, maybe a 
I don't know, the, a media center that has to see your movies and so on. You have a, a computer with Wi-Fi, we can connect a smartphone and a lot of devices. But what happens is that every device, every system, you have maybe the air conditioning system, which is the latest generation, is able to, uh, to control every aspect of your climate. But what happens today is that the different systems are separate from each other. So from your smart TV, it can be smart, but it cannot control the air condition. They are separate systems. Okay? And separate systems, they can, they can do perfectly their job. Each one can do perfectly their single specific job. But they cannot help the user directly. They can react to the comment. We need to have something that integrates, that glues everything together. Okay? And usually, say, we, we have the term middleware for something that stands in between and is able to manage, like an operating system. Something that is able to manage all the different specificity of the devices and offer some services to integrate them and to enable the development of applications. Application is something which has a specific utility, a specific goal for the user. So there could be an application for managing the lights uh, that integrates the lighting, uh, the blinds, uh, the doors, and uh, something like that. There can be an application that that for climate that integrates the air conditioning and, and also the blinds, because maybe there's sun outside and you want to control the blinds to control the temperature, not just the light. So different devices, different subsystems must be um, let's say, manage at a higher level and together. And of course, on top of that, there are the users that can benefit from these applications and should be shielded as much as possible, separated as much as possible from the details of the single devices to do this step from reactive to proactive, from smart or automation to intelligent. Um, so this was just a flash about the definition Let's go back to the content of the course, so how we try to break down this topic. Uh, we will try to have a look, uh, of course, at the definitions and the application areas and the systems that we use to build uh, these ambient intelligent uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we'll try to also to have a sort of a, an overview, a taxonomy, of what is available there. What are the categories of devices? There is a strong converging movement in these years of technologies that were developed in different areas that are now converging to the smart home. Everybody is trying to dominate in the house. Everybody from consumer electronics producers, telecom operators, uh, TV operators, uh, um, let's say um, electric plant manufacturers, electric utilities, so the whole, the, those who bring you the energy, all of them would, would really like to own your home, right? to own the control of your home. And who wins, uh, we don't know, but at least we want to be aware of this wide, wide offer. Hmm? Uh, okay, we will talk about the feature-driven design methodology, and uh, we also, of course, need to have some technologies to work with. So we will have a, a, a one track in the course that talks about the um, rapid, rapid prototyping techniques. So a way to put together some working application uh, as a prototype, as something that works uh, but doesn't require uh, too much time, too much effort, because we don't need to have a final product well polished and engineered and so on. Uh, we'll have a look also at some of the main automation technologies because today you already can have an, a, a house, if you have enough money, of course, a house with a lot of automation. Everything can be automated. This is standard technology. You just need to pay for that. But this standard technology is something that we can, we can use to build on top of it, to build behaviors. So what, some of these devices are already existing. You can use them. And some of them are, say, this home automation technology, smart homes. Mm. In some languages, uh, we use the term domotics or domotica, 
I, I won't be able to use it because it's not that you, in the English the word does, doesn't exist. They don't use that. They use smartphone instead of domotica. Hmm? Uh, but just to understand among us. And uh, uh, of course, these, uh, the practical activities of this process will be, as I handled, as a group work, uh, which is a part of the activities that you will do in the, in the lab hours. So we are trying to mix uh, three main ways of telling things. One is giving, giving a look at the theory, so what are the definition, what is the methodology, and so on, and the research. So uh, something is actually, no, uh, research groups in the world are still working on these issues. It's not something that is already established. So for some things, there will not be a, a definite answer, a definite solution. This is, okay, three and four is seven. No, uh, we will uh, still are, say, working and searching in this area. The other is technology. So w technology we can work with today and maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow we try also to have a look at uh, what's coming, uh, what's next. And the practice, so how to put everything together, theory and technology, and try to build something. Practically working. More or less the size of these balls are equal and it, it corresponds more or less to the number of hours that we are, we are allocating to the different uh, uh, say topics in the, in the course. Um, so this more or less repeats what I, saw, uh, what I already said. Theory, technology, practical for yes, there's nothing really new in this. Uh, in these slides compared to the previous one. It just, uh, it's just more convenient to read it when you have the printed slides uh, instead of just a picture when you have to remember what I was said. OK, uh, so the ultimate goal is here. Learn to design and build, I already said at the beginning, some working solution. So what's the organization that we have for this course? Any questions so far? Not yet. Uh, so the teachers, we are three people. Uh, I am uh, Fulvio Corno, the first one, and these two guys there, we were, we were trying to hide, and uh, are the other two people that uh, are doing the hard work of help me, helping me in this course. Uh, is uh, Dario Bonino and uh, is uh, Luigi De Russis. Uh, you need to. Come here because there's an eye there that wants to <laughs> up there. They need to be centered. Okay, so you will see them starting from Thursday, say, and uh, and for the next weeks uh, on. Hmm? Okay, so we are uh, splitting the, the the course in, in three, hmm? in three, 20 hours each for the total of 60 hours. So as you will you there will not be a dominant figure in the in the in the course. Okay, and we will mix uh, lectures, exercises, and labs uh, with different people. So there won't, there, won't, uh, there won't be one person saying this is the lab person. So we will uh, uh, merge in this way. Okay, so just so that if you if you meet them, you just can recognize them, and uh, you will have many occasions to see also Dario and Luigi. Okay, thank you. Okay, the schedule. We have this very, very nice uh, uh, schedule. So uh, in, we have all these evenings uh, of, uh, of this uh, spring and summer uh, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. The number of hours which is available is uh, higher than the number of hours that we use. Okay? All these courses were allocated four slots two on the Monday, slots of 1.5 hours, of course. Four, two on the Monday and two on Thursday. Yes. Um, we won't be using all of them. We are not using all of them. In general, the last hours of the Monday will not be used, except for two times. Only twice we will need to use these hours. In general, on the Monday, we will go to the lab 
but initially, for the first weeks, uh, even the Monday will be here in the classroom. The Thursday, we have no choice because the lab is not available on Thursday, so we'll have everything here, in the, not here, but in the other room, 3i, downstairs, underground, and uh, um, for three hours. We will do all of these three hours every week, except for the final two weeks. Okay, so we are doing a couple of times these hours, and we are recovering a couple of times these other hours towards towards the end of the course, so you have more time to work on your exam and so on. Uh, the, the, the detail of which lecture or do, where do we go today, uh, do we go to the La Dispo or to the room and so on, you will see that on the course website where we have the detailed calendar and uh, there's a log section, we, I show you the course in a second. Okay. So every week will be, will be different, so we can keep awake for that. I hope, or you should not have any problems with this schedule, at least for those of you who are in the third year. They told me that these days were allocated to the elective courses and so. In any case, as you see from this um, uh, equipment and science fiction devices, uh, all the, the, the classes and the lectures are being recorded, so if, if something happens uh, uh, for some reason, uh, you can, uh, of course, have the lecture on the, on the portale hmm? and see it. Um, the lab. You will have more details. I won't tell you everything today at the first time, because <laughs> we need to tell you in, in small steps, but uh, in order to avoid this effect. Um, the lab will be in the La Dispe. La Dispe, everybody knows where this uh, uh, lab is. is uh, you just follow the signs for room uh, 12. Okay, just after room 12, if you do five more steps, you are out of the Polytechnico, but you just turn left and you go to this uh, lab, okay? So it's uh, near to room 12, as, uh, side by side with room 16 and above room 14. So if you are in the north corner of Politecnico. Hmm? Um, the lab is, I think, the most important part of the course. Because if you miss a lecture, a class here, Okay, you've missed an opportunity to ask a question or to find some friends, but you can see the, the, the recorded lecture and you can recover easily. The lab is something that cannot be substituted. It will not be recorded, of course, it's not possible, but something where you actually do and work and find the problems and find the solutions and uh, find help from the people who is there to, for helping you. In the lab, there are some computers, of course, but there is also some uh, smart home hardware. So we have some devices, real devices, that you can find in your home. We have some kits uh, to use them in the lab, and some wireless devices, and something also to, to build some custom solutions. So uh, we have different types of devices with different technologies, and we are able to play uh, with all of them, and of course then, Every group will select one of them. Uh, more or less, we have uh, split the hours in the lab in 50-50, two sets. 50% um, is something like guided ex exercises, so they give you something to, to do in the lab. But the other half would be, I call them, supervised group work. So hours in which you, we are not proposing anything new, it's just time when you can go there and work together on your assignment, on your exam, actually. And we will be there, some of us will be there to help you. Okay, so just to avoid, since we are working with hardware, which is not something that you have in your house, it's not just a software course, we want to give you some time to work and develop that. So the, on, the, on the log, uh, these hours will be marked with supervised group work, and so this is the time when you can go and work forward. 
as I already mentioned, uh, is uh, we will uh, ask you to create some groups and do some group work in the course. We will define later the, the rules for the groups and so on. Um, on Monday, next Monday, uh, we will uh, give you instructions for how to form the groups uh, and what we are expecting from you. Actually, the first step uh, we are expecting from you is an idea. The group should propose okay, uh, some idea of a small ambient intelligence system or small or smart environment to implement. And that will be the topic of the group work. You won't have to come up with ideas on next Monday. You will have a couple of weeks during which you will learn also start using the technologies and see and have time and have a way to discuss. And by the end of the month, we should be able to fix the assignments. Okay, so okay, this every group groups will be formed and assignments would be let's say fixed and they will be the basis of the next work. During this period, you will try to also to manage a sort of a collaboration platform online so that you can exchange ideas, form the groups, interact in this period uh, on the topic of the of the of the groups and of the topics. But we will give you all the details next time, just to understand what, what will come. And the work should be, say, finished by the end of the course, ideally. Hmm? Uh, I just want to mention that some of the equipment we have in the, in the lab has been donated by some companies, and I thank them in this case. You will see that, so I won't be, I'm, I'm not doing any marketing here, and just uh, say, some, some of that has been bought by us, not by Polytechnic, but by the research group, and some by this company that collaborate with us. So thanks to them, because it enables us to do the lab part, which is, uh, as I mentioned, the most important. OK. This morning, I had, uh, in the Portale della Didattica, 48 people in this course. Okay. Um, I know some more are coming, uh, so we will be around 50 probably, more or less. Hmm? This number has been changed, changing every day since the beginning. Hmm? I remember a couple of months ago they were telling you, oh, you, don't, you will, will not have 20 students, so we'll close the course and so on. Now we are, we are 50 and we are starting to have problems with the lab, with the capacity of the lab in terms of people. But I'm happy with that. Just to have an idea, I try to break down by the, the code of, the, of the, um, the degree that you're following. So the biggest group in this room or in the course in general is people who are doing the uh, informatica, the computer science degree, 16 over 48, this is one third. Actually, there's one more here, down here, which is 17, hmm? but with a different code. The second group is blank. It just means that the portfolio didn't assign any degree. These are most likely um, Erasmus students. Okay. Oh, just uh, can you raise your hands from Informatica so that we can also know each other? Okay. This one, the W1. Okay. And uh, there's nothing wrong with, with him, OK? <laughs> um, and uh, the 10 people, or more or less, that come with Erasmus uh, or foreign students, uh, can you raise your hands? And uh, we see, I see four hands only. There are six hiding. Or, uh, OK, May, maybe we'll read two names. So at the end, <laughs> when you have not been called, <laughs> just um, I would like to know more or less from these people what is their background. Because from people in Polytechnic, I know more or less what they studied in the previous years. For, for you, uh, you four and six hiding more, um, 
I, I, I don't know. Hmm? So maybe you can, you can write, uh, or if you don't, or, or maybe at the end of the, of the class, just to give me an idea. I come from a uh, you know, computer science background, or I come from a building background, or I came from, OK? Um, the, OK, the third group is uh, electronica, electronics, students, cinema, so electronics, who's there? Cinema, one, two, three, OK? And uh, so from our point of view, these three groups, uh, informatic, electronic, and cinema, more or less are uniform. Let's say. From the point of view, the background uh, that, that is needed in, the, in this course, I'm not saying uh, you are equal, OK? Don't start fighting. Um, and then we have uh, uh, something else, so the long tail, uh, some three people from uh, design industrial, from architecture. Yeah. Okay. Design your communication. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. It's a it's a course in, in architecture, not in uh, yeah, engineering. Yeah. Okay. So it, it counts by three, for three. Okay. Uh, in the in, in forming the groups, uh, it's twice also to exploit no, these different uh, background, different disciplines that we have. No? So let's try not to have a group uh, of the industrial design people and another of only electronics so try try to mix okay this is a strong message because actually a smart building is requires different know-how to work together hmm? otherwise we are building some monster okay something that is very sophisticated from a technical point of view but you cannot look at it okay or you cannot use it or something very nice that that actually it's very nice, but it does nothing. Or okay, there are some extremes. Uh, and okay, and then smaller groups of uh, electrotechnic, electrica, electrical engineer, one and two. Those people are fighting hard to be here. <laughs> uh, and uh, and other uh, people from okay, this one mechanica. Okay, it's already repented. Uh, telecomunicazioni is there. And uh, this one, I don't know. Electronica is and ENZ, maybe the magistrale. Yeah, probably. Uh, and one gestionale and one energetics. Hmm? Here, energetics. A gestionale? It's out, gaining money. Um, okay. Okay, so just so that you start also knowing each other, the only information I'm missing is uh, from the others, from this group. Hmm? I want to show the names up here in the recorded uh, lecture. Okay, so we can do that offline. Okay, so, so much for the organization. Any questions so far? Okay, anybody wants to leave the room now? No. Uh, resources. So what are the resources that we use during the course? The main and only resource uh, to start with is the website of the course. Okay, so important that they gave us a short address to that. You already know that, probably. And this, this simple page, but that's a gathering point for all, for all the information. And this page has some uh, sections with the, okay, the, the main page where I'm trying to post some news. So if I have some news, uh, I will write them. If they are important news, I will also send you a message, an email message to the portal or an SMS. But if, if you just uh, say news updates and something like that, uh, I will just post them here. And on Facebook, I will tell you later. Uh, information, um, it just has some, something that Apart from the class hours that you already know, it's something that you, you don't need that anymore, okay? Once the course is started, you don't need this information, this section of the page anymore. It's for attracting new people. Uh, materials is the most important we, we, that we now is nearly empty, but we will grow significantly during the course. In the materials section, you will have all the slides, for example, the ones that you are using now, and uh, uh, all the links to papers, uh, readings, links, and something like that. So everything 
as a resource here for learning will be in this section of the course. And uh, the other important section is the log. The log, or registro, as we call them, um, as a list of the lectures of the classes that we are, that if you look in the future, that we expect to give, and if you look at the past, that uh, that becomes more precise. So this is the planning that we have for the course. We see the teacher, you see the hours. When you see EL, EL stands from, in the, say, bureaucracy of the Politecnico stands from exercising in laboratory. It's a citation in laboratory. So whenever you say EL, it means that we are in the LADISPE. Whenever you see lecture or EA, exercitazione in aula, exercise in the classroom, we are in the class here on the 3i row. Okay? So this is the information that you need not to be lost, which are the ERs. The teacher and more or less the topics that you are expecting to give. Okay, this is a, a planning, okay, a tentative planning. We don't know whether things will go the way we planned. Okay? We try, but uh, okay. So if we change the topic or if we change the teacher at the last moment, of course we will tell you, but uh, okay, don't fight us. Hmm? Uh, after the lecture, we'll try to post uh, the videos and the materials uh, related to that, that specific lecture also in this uh, thing. And of course, after the lecture, you will, the, we will update uh, the topic with the, if we change something, we will update it. So the past will be updated and full of information, the future will be. And the far future will be also more, uh, say, tentative than the, than the near future. It's just a shared communication tool, this page, so that we can update information. You will get updated. And you know that if for one day there will be a strike uh, you can, of the trains, you cannot come here, you know what you are losing, no? because it's, it's written up there. OK, so it's very simple, but uh, I think it's a, my, in my experience, uh, it's being very effective to have one central point like that. I'm not using the Portale della Didattica to hold this information because I know there are, there are always some students that are problem with the curriculum didattic or with the enrollment. Some Erasmus are coming later, but so they start following uh, immediately, but they need time to register and so on. And so, uh, I, I, this information will be publicly accessible to everybody, no password, nothing. Hmm? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, additionally, I, I sent an email to, not to all of you, but to, to a subset of you who were enrolled a couple of uh, uh, weeks, weeks ago, but now I can tell to everybody. I set up a Facebook page. I don't know if it will be useful or not that we can use it uh, as, a, as a communication tool. You can use it freely to share information, uh, to ask questions, uh, to discuss even among you. So I will be reading, but uh, if it's something among you, I don't feel, uh, I say, to, to, to respond. Um, it's an experiment. I never did that in, in any course. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if, let, let's see and say if it turns out to be useful. Uh, it's not the official, it's the official page of the course, but I won't treat it as, as an official communication tool. Not everybody has Facebook or wants to have it. Not everybody wants to sign to this page, okay? So the official channel is the course website and the communication of the Portale della Didattica. Those are still and continue to be the official channels. Okay, this is something more to help collaboration, okay? Okay, uh, apart from that, we don't have much more, or too much more, maybe, or, or maybe we have too much more. I mean, there is no suitable textbook. As I said, uh, we are talking about technology that is on the market, so there is a lot of technical information about that. But it's not a textbook. It's data sheets and manuals and protocols and specifications, millions of pages. It's research. There's a lot of papers, research papers that we can access, we can read, but they are not in a textbook form. 
There are some books that talk about ambient intelligence, but they are sort of research books. Research books usually are a collection of papers from the researchers which are, say, emerging in some specific area. So it's not something like a textbook. There is no such thing as a textbook. Hmm? We'll, have, uh, we'll try to share all the information we have in the actions of a book. So all the slides, the videos, suggesting papers, suggesting documents, and so on. Okay, so we'll be uh, a mixture of this kind of information. Uh, most of it, uh, sorry, most importantly, is not uh, what is written on the slides, but it's what you learn in the lab that will count. So the experience and learning and doing hmm? and designing something. About designing something, uh, the exam. The exam will be so I, I well, in designing the kind of exam to ask you in the course. We started from these points. So uh, the goal of the course is. Uh, design and develop an MEA system, so the exam should be able to assess your capability to design and develop. Okay? We close the loop. Multiple skills and disciplines are needed in the process. That's why I was mentioning, let's say, creating groups with different people inside. The course is more than one third in the lab, so the lab is still the most important part. And uh, uh, we want to see the capacity to create a solution and also the process that you follow in defining that. Not just throwing some technology, but following, let's say, a design process. And the last two points are something related to the timing and to the calendar. So most of you are close to graduation, close to the end of the third year. I hope you are not having many other credits in, in, uh, in the backlog. So you want to close as soon as possible, which is a good. Uh, uh, and uh, the other people coming from, from abroad uh, need to return back to their universities. OK? And uh, they won't be able to give the exam in September or in January or whatever. So what we, wanted, what we would like to try to do is to have an exam that consists uh, essentially in the evaluation of the group work. So at the end of March, we define the group work. You can start working. You will have the hours in the lab to work. And at the end of the course, you have your work finished. And that is your exam. Of course, you have to present it. And we will need to evaluate it and stop. So the idea is if you follow and if you exploit well the lab, you will have your exam done by the, by the end of the course, but plus some hours, some nights in fixing it at the end, but they were finishing. Okay? This is, in the case people is able to follow the course, so have the, having the, the frequency of the classes and, and especially of the labs, and has time to develop it by June. So we will have the two exams in June with the two dates, uh, and in, in these days you can say, uh, have your work evaluated. If you can do that, uh, we will try, we will study some way to do that uh, later, in September, in January, in the usual. Uh, the issue is very simple. I, if you want to give the, if you haven't finished by mid-July, when there will be the second date, it will be very difficult for you to complete the work for September because the lab in August is, is closed and you are doing something else very likely. So since it's a practical work and needs some specific equipment, it will not be so easy to prepare it or to finish it for other. But we'll find a way. I would say the main goal would be try to exploit the two exam days in July and June. June and July. Um, and otherwise, we will, we will, of course, write some detailed rules of the exam, but we, I, I don't want to spend the first class to, to discuss the exam. The idea is there. Okay? Okay. Um, okay, just two points. We'll try for every uh, set of slides uh, to always have, at the end, two slides. Uh, 
which are recurrent. One is called references, where we try to link all the sources from which we gather information. So if we have some information, some pictures, some, uh, some something we discussed in the slides, uh, I will put a reference at the end. Uh, and uh, there will also be some license. I don't know if any of you is uh, familiar with licenses, uh, the, say, all the rights, uh, uh, copyright rules uh, about material and so on. And we chose, uh, as we are also, let's say, putting all the material on the website, which is public to everybody, we need, of course, of course to be very explicit with the, um, with the license. Actually, what this, uh, everybody of you should be familiar with licenses, sooner or later. If you are doing software, if you are doing some new design, new intellectual property, if you are writing some document, if you are doing presentation, anything, it's something that you should learn. Okay? So, Put the mark on your agenda, learn something about licenses, open source or whatever. Uh, what this says, basically, we are using the Creative Commons licenses, which are very used in the, in the open world, in the, with, with uh, say, favorite the, the exchange of information. And basically, what this license says, you don't need to read every, all of it, it says that uh, you can use and reuse any, in any, any, way, any way you like this material. So you can download it and use it, distribute, give it to your friend, provided that you meet three conditions. First, buy, attribution. You don't hide the source. You always mention where did you get it from. So these are the slides of uh, Polytechnic Ultra and that course and so on. That's enough. You don't need to ask permission for doing that. But you, you, just, you cannot just put your name on top of that and hide the previous attribution. NC, non-commercial, you cannot do money with that. If you find a way of doing money with this material, just tell me, we'll share it, okay? Uh, no, it's, uh, actually, the open source uh, ideas are like that. This is a license that is quite granted to everybody. We, as the owners of the material, can always grant additional, let's say, um, rights uh, if needed. So if you want to do something commercial, you need to ask permission. If you want to use it in a non-commercial, so you're not making money out of it, you can use it without asking permission. That's the issue. You need to ask. SA, share alike. If you share it with somebody else, you should be sharing it in the same way that I am sharing it with you. So you cannot restrict. You cannot give it to, to your friend and say, OK, but don't copy it. Okay? You cannot be more restrictive than I am with you. These are very simple rules. Hmm? It may seem stupid to discuss this stuff, but let's try, let's try to let's say, start using this mindset. Okay? I can, it's not that if I found it on the internet, I can do whatever I, I want. There's always some rights associated to every content that you find. Okay. So all of our, all of our slides are released with this license. OK, this is a f for the introduction. We still have some time for, for starting the, the topics of the course, uh, unless there are some questions. No? OK. So let me start uh, with uh, the other. Can you understand my English? Yeah. Sort of. OK. Um, so let's start by rereading the definitions that we gave and try to understand a bit better what we mean by ambient intelligence or smart environment. We need to reflect on this because the type of uh, group work that you will be proposing needs uh, to match with this criteria. Okay? You will not propose anything that is too, too stupid. Hmm? So, about the definitions, as I said, it's not an easy question. What is ambient intelligence? Everybody have, has their own version about that. It's a wide area 
it covers, you will see, uh, it covers a lot of disciplines. And the expectations uh, are evolving over time. It means that what I expected from a smart environment five years ago, 10 years ago, before the age of the smartphones, for example, is very different from what we expect today. Okay? And so having a definition that, let's say, is able to survive over time is very difficult. So actually what I'm saying is that we are not able to give a real definition. We can do a prediction. We can define something, some area in which we predict that tomorrow we will have some solutions, some products, some systems that match this definition. That maybe today doesn't describe anything real yet because we are working on that. Uh, if you search for the literature, you find a lot of definitions for these terms. Uh, and some people are trying to put things together. Just to tell you, there, there, there is a starting point, which is quite old, actually. This is a document uh, it's called the Scenarios for Ambient Intelligence in 2010. It was written 10 years late, uh, before. It was written in 2001. 2001 is uh, 13 years from today. 13 years ago, 14 because they wrote it the, the year before, 14 years ago, people were thinking about, OK, what can, may, may happen? What can happen in the field of ambient intelligence in 10 years? They targeted 2010. And these are a group of people that were, say, funded, paid, consultants that were paid, experts, paid by the European Com Commission to do this study. The European Commission often does things like that. You find some people, you, find, you ask them to write a vision of the future, and you use that to decide where the funding goes, where the public funds for the research should go based on what the experts say that, that would be the, the direction. And the people wrote in the introduction of this document, which is available, there's, there are the links, uh, the concept of MEI, I mean intelligence, provides a vision of the information society where the emphasis is on greater user friendliness. Again, we always start from the user with words. Okay, every definition starts from, okay, this is done for the user. The issue that we will see that, okay, everybody is talking about the user, but if you see the, the technologies, if you see the devices, if you see the system, usually they are done without thinking about the user, but only thinking about the technology. We, we did a research, uh, Luigi did a research uh, last week for the number of papers talking about ambient intelligence and smart environments, total number of papers published, he tried to find the subset of these papers that talked about uh, user interaction. So if all of this is for the users, probably it should be 80% of the papers talking about users. It's 8%, not 80. Okay? Because the technology is easier. People are developing, are studying, are creating, are experimenting, and they write a paper. But you are not advancing toward the goal. The goal is to satisfy the user, not to have some nice technology to play with. More efficiency services support, user empowerment, and support for, user, for human interactions. People are surrounded by intelligent, intuitive interfaces that are embedded in all kinds of objects. Intuitive interfaces that are embedded in all kinds of objects. Okay? Objects, not computers. In this case, uh, in, inside this table, there is a computer. I don't see it. I see some buttons, not the computer. Tomorrow, I don't want to see the buttons anymore. Also. I don't want to know. I don't need to know where is the computer. I need to interact with objects, with my house. Hmm? Um, and there is a... a Probably you have heard something about the Internet of Things. Everybody is talking about Internet of Things. You need to say that at least three or four times a day, okay? Internet of Things. 
uh, actually is uh, about uh, having objects connected between each other. To do what? We don't know very well, but they need to be connected. Um, and an environment that is capable of recognizing and responding, recognizing and responding. So they understand what you are doing and they respond. Not to your command. They don't are responding to the fact that you push the button. The response is the fact that, oh, you're sitting on the sofa, so they switch on the TV. Okay, it's not so lazy. We don't need that, okay? We have the remote for doing that. But the idea is that they understand what you need, and they act. To the presence of different individuals, this is very difficult. You see a lot of prototypes around that work well with one person. But when you start working with two people in the same environment, the very few systems are able to distinguish between, between, between the two of them. Which is which? Unless you sensorize the people, you put something in them, boom, it's a, it's a challenge. In a seamless and an obtrusive and invisible way. So you should be using the home without having a degree in, a, uh, in engineering. Your mother, your grandmother should be able to use it. They are able to use the television. Why shouldn't it be used? Something which is a thousand times more intelligent. That's the challenge. No, that was the challenge 14 years ago. Do we have still? Oh, this was for 2010. So four years ago, we should have everything of this in our homes. Do we? Okay, so there's still something, some, some of these issues are being covered very well today. All the multimedia part, all the mobile part, we are starting to work on the body sensor part with all the smart watches and bracelets and some stuff like that. So the localization part with the GPS and the mobile phones, there's a lot of advancement, but we are still not there. We are still not to the user. We, we advanced a lot, but the user is still far. We cannot touch it yet. So we still need to work. It's very interesting to see what they wrote 14 years ago, which is still, you can, okay, you can have a look at documents, you can delete the sentences that are, have already been done, and you see that a lot of, of this document is still valid today. Okay, this is just a, a, a glimpse uh, of many other definitions of ambient intelligence that we find in different papers. I don't want to read all of them, just to have a look and see that actually they are all similar, but every researcher wants to say that they are writing it better. And they write the same things with slightly different words, but especially with a different focus, because they are more interested in one part or more interested in the other part, and so they try to give a definition that better matches with what they are actually doing or they want to do. Hmm? It's normal. And the two main definitions that, that we want to use are those that I already showed you 40 minutes ago, a system which proactively supports people in their daily lives. Hmm? And proactive and sensibly are the two, say, different points of view, uh, different requirements that are, that are difficult to, to match. Hmm? And this is the other definition. I won't read it again here. Uh, what do we need for getting these results? Something that proactively but sensibly understands what I want and does it before I even think about it. Hmm? Something that, uh, I don't know, my watch alarm that wakes me up in the morning should talk to my coffee machine so that when I wake up, uh, it's ready. Or half an hour ago, uh, half an hour before, it should talk to the, um, to the heating system of my house. So that, so that it can be adjusted to, to the alarm clock and tomorrow morning we'll have to wake up earlier because they have a class at 8.30 and everything adjusts itself. 
I can do that today. You have, you have the, you go into a, a shop and you find a, a coffee machine with a timer. It's a product. You can have everybody in your house, you have the thermostats in which you, you can program the, the time at which the heating goes on tomorrow morning. But you do that explicitly, device by device. If you want everything to be done, everything together, all the types of devices together, and automatically. This is what we want. What do we need from the engineering point of view, from the technology point of view? Uh, we need uh, everything networked, everything connected through the network. So the coffee machine should have the Wi-Fi, or the Zigbee, or the Bluetooth, or something. Because otherwise, there will be no way of, se of telling the coffee machine at what time to get up, or what time to warm up. Hmm? Networks, sir. not just one. Because there are some devices where you can give uh, an internet connection, a cable, and you are done. Some devices will use Wi-Fi. Some devices are not uh, clever enough to use Wi-Fi. It's a complex protocol. It draws uh, a lot of energy. And if you have a thermostat in your house, go to your house. You find, in my house, there's a thermostat with two batteries, AA batteries. You cannot run Wi-Fi on AA batteries. On one day, or two days maybe, then you change the batteries. Okay? So you need something, a different networking technology that is compatible with the size, with the power requirements, and so on, of the different devices. By the way, thermostat does not be to be always on. You measure the temperature every half an hour, 15 minutes, and then you communicate not every second. Wi-Fi is not the solution. You need something that can be switched off and on every time you need it. So that's why we need to have, there will not be one solution, one networking solution for your smartphone. If you go to a manufacturer, they will say, my solution is good for everything. Don't believe them. There will be many te techniques and many technologies some, we can discuss them today. Some others, probably, we need to discuss them next year because they're not being invented yet. Every year, there's something new that adds up to what is, was already existing before. And so, all these different types of networks, you cannot imagine that my stupid alarm watch is able to speak 27 different networks or network protocols. You need something in between, something that does a mediator role, a gateway, a middleware. So this is the minimum requirement. Otherwise, you're not even doing automation. Or you are doing automation with, with many different separate vertical systems. Hmm? Of course, these networks and these middleware should be attached to something, some sensors that tell me the temperature, tell me the time, tell me the light, tell me the humidity, tell me whether I am in the room or not, tell me whether I'm moving or not, tell my position in, uh, in the three axis, and so on. This is easy. No, it's not easy. There are a lot, millions, not millions, tens of thousands of different types of sensors. If you search for a sensor, there's a whole industry that produces sensors for you. You can measure anything. The, the, the pollution in the air, they, they're a bit costly, but you can do that. You can have a meteor a sensor that can tell you everything about the air and the temperature, humidity, wind, uh, wind directions, everything. And every year you have new ones. You take any smartphone, it has probably 10 or 12 sensors. That the compact accelerometer, the uh, luminosity sensor, and the GPS, and the NFC, and so, so, I, I, 
and actuators. So sensors and to measure something and actuators to do something. So when the ambient intelligence understands that, that you want the door to be open, the garage door to be open because you are about to leave home, you need something <laughs> that is able to make that happen, to actuate the common. Okay? It can be something like stupid like a relay. It can be even something simple, but you need something that acts, huh? that creates some actions. Actions that can be physical actions, that can be closing a circuit for, the, for switching on the light, for give, maybe giving a notification on your mobile, maybe playing an audio message in your house, but something that has an impact over the environment where you are living. The output of all the uh, reasoning cannot be, stay inside the system. It needs to go out to the user eventually. Um, purposes, pervasive computing and ubiquitous computing are terms that are able uh, um, that uh, say describe the area of research in computer science uh, where you say uh, consider the issues in having many small devices, a large number of devices that are distributed. So maybe body sensor, maybe you, the, you know probably the, all the RFID tags that are in the clothes that you buy for or in the shops to avoid you as a stealing stuff and so on. Uh, these are very simple, but are example of microprocessors that come in thousands. In one shop you have thousands of them, so you need a way to manage them. Uh, pervasive and ubiquitous are two, let's say, uh, bl different blends. Uh, one of them talks, um, let's say, discusses more about the networking issues, how to make these things talk together, and the other more about the usability issues. Hmm? So ubiquitous means everywhere. Pervasive means everywhere. So <laughs> uh, more or less they're talking about the same thing. But we are talking about hundreds or thousands of sensors and, and actuators, non, not 12. Hmm? And so we need to, to manage the system in a different way, of course. When you have uh, hundreds of sensors, many of, them, many of them will be broken. It's a law of nature. Many of them will be broken. Many of them will be just crazy, just sending random data. They not be, will not be reliable. Some of them will be off batteries, or can, or will be outside the uh, Wi-Fi or uh, network coverage. So there's a lot of issue of the devices that just come and go and can break, and, and you need to manage all of that. It's not heavy. Okay, I have a server with 25 CPUs, and that's mine. I can, I have everything under control. No, the world is not under your control. Human-computer interaction. So what is the best way for a system like this to interact with the user? So human-computer interaction is a very strong field. And uh, it's due to the human-computer interaction field that today you pick a smartphone or a tablet, you give it to a two or three years old boy or girl, and they can use it. They can use it. They don't know what they're doing, probably, but they're, they are able to open the game that they want. They know where to find it and how to open and how to close it, without training, just by looking at what the other did. This is not by accident. There are not these people which are extremely intelligent. It's the design of the interface that pixel after pixel, detail after detail, convention after convention, got better and better and better than the years. If you can go to any website in, and in less than half a second, you understand where is search, where is the home page, where is the menu, where is the content, where is the footer. You, you just have a look and you know everything. You are not extra fast or extra intelligent. It's the design of the website which is well done. So human computer interaction did a very strong uh, steps for 
mainly web and mobile applications. If you use a desktop program, they, they are more difficult to use. Okay? Even if they may be simpler in terms of functionality with respect to a website. But here we need to restart thinking about the interaction of the human with a computer which doesn't exist. Okay, it exists, but you don't see it. You don't have a keyboard, you don't have a screen, you don't have anything to touch. You may have a touch panel in your house, but that's not so intelligent. You need to be proactive. So, so in some way, you need to find new ways of interaction. For example, the natural interaction methods, gestures, movements, and so on, sensors in your body that are able to, to track what you're doing, are, are, I don't know, a new way. They're trying to do that, to use different new ways of interaction. So we need to go forward also in this direction. And of course, to be intelligent, we need some intelligent algorithms. Something which is able to reason about all the inputs that they get, all the preferences or requirements for the user, all the context in which is happening today, and then decide what actions to take. So this is more or less the main loop of an MEI system. The system should be sensing the environment. What is happening? I have hundred sensors that measure different stuff. From all of this data, I gather this data and compute a reason. I try to understand what is happening and to understand what the user might want from me. And from the end of this reasoning, I decide how to act, what to do. And after that, I need acting, doing the action. The action will have an effect on the environment. So the user, the user, the user is interacting with the environment is an in an implicit way. It senses that the environment is changing. And with these actions, with this normal life, he, the user is giving inputs to the sensors of the house. You don't need to go there and write. The sensors are feeling what you're doing. And they're trying to interpret it and, and close the loop. So this is the, what we want to achieve. As I said, today you cannot go to a shop and say, I want one of these. Not yet. You can very easily use the first and the, the one at the top and the one at the bottom. Sensors, you have any kind of sensor, starting from 20 euros to thousands, depending on the type of measure that they give, and the actuation that you have all the domotics field that is ready for you for actuating everything. The hard parts are user interaction and intelligence to transform a, a simple home automation into a home intelligence. We we'll continue this uh, on Thursday because the time is over for today. If you have any questions, otherwise, today we finish here. Okay, we don't we don't continue for the next hours. The, the first class seemed too too much. Okay, thank you.